Hey, Real Life Church, I hope you're excited for a new series to start this week called Hand Up. My name is Aaron Dickinson, and I get to be the location pastor here at the Mountain Home location of Real Life Church. And I'm looking forward to this series. I'm honored to be able to start it up for us and dive into uh, why outreach matters as a church and what we do through our Reach Center and what to look for, what to expect, why the call of God of going out and reaching people and making a difference and serving them is such a, a a, a, a crucial thing for the local church. Uh, if you don't know, uh, we have a, a center here at Real Life Church called the Reach Center. And it's an organization that we operate out of where we do things like resume building, job interview training, um, basic life skills things like uh, how to cook on a budget, how to do laundry, basic automotive skills, um, as well as we open up as a warming shelter during the winter months when it's super, super cold or there's snow on the ground for homeless in our area. And we get to do a lot of really neat things through our Reach Center. So I, I want to say thank you to Real Life Church for being generous and going with the vision for the call. Um, as, as we go through this vision for the year, this mission of change happens here. And we've been saying that we're not just a church in our community, but we're a church that changes changes the community. And we really believe that. And we want to say thank you for uh, being a part of this thing we call life, being a part of this mission, being a part of Real Life Church, and being able to help us further the gospel and make an impact to those around us. Um, I want to unpack today. Um, I'm coming to you now online because we had some issues uh, with our audio playback this weekend. So I get to hang out with you face-to-face -face, um, right now in this moment. I guess not really face-to-face, -face, but uh, screen to screen is what we'll say. And I get to um, bring this message directly to you rather than being in a room full of people. So I hope you enjoy uh, what God has laid upon my heart and being able to, to communicate with you today. And, and I want us to unpack a, a scripture, a passage um, in Habakkuk, and then we're going to go to some other scriptures as well. And we're going to ask some simple questions that have a lot of depth to them. And they're questions that we ask all the time. But if you're taking notes, uh, whether you're sitting at your coffee table and on your couch or you're listening um, in your car, if you're listening in your car, you're probably not taking notes. Um, but whatever it is that you do when you listen to these messages online um, and you do take notes, I want you to title it this, Where is my help? It's a question we ask a lot of times, whether it's someone that we, we, we think someone needs to come alongside us because we can't fulfill a task by ourselves. Maybe it's we need a resource. Maybe we need some assistance. Um, but where is my help? So in this first passage I want us to look at today in Habakkuk chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says this is, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. This cry that Habakkuk's bringing, I feel like feels so much like the world that we live in today. Why does violence happen? Why do attacks take place? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why are the righteous being surrounded by the wicked? All these things that take place in our life that we have struggles with and we have big questions with and we bring them to the church, we bring them to God or we ask ourselves. And I think it's because as humans, we are creatures of habit. We so often make the same decision and same mistake that was happened in times and years past. This cry that Habakkuk's bringing thousands of years ago is the same things, are the same things that we're crying out to God in this, why is injustice happening? Why are you just sitting back and watching these things take place? And so today, as we dive into this, what does that mean for the church when these people are asking these questions? So Habakkuk is a man of God is crying out saying, how can you let these things happen to your people? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever sat back and said, God, where are you? 
God, I don't know why this is happening to me. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why my grandpa didn't deserve to die? Why are we struggling and we're facing divorce? Why did I lose my job when when I thought everything was going right and I'm the hardest worker here at, at our workplace? Why do these things happen? Why are so many things feeling like they're falling apart? God, where are you? It's the first question I want us to ask today is where is God? Where is God? It's a question that seems so silly when we look at the actual premise of it, because if you're a Christian, then you know that scripture says that God is always present. He is always there. But yet we still ask this question of where is God? I don't know about you, but there's been a couple of different times in my life that I've felt lost. I actually was lost. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. And the first time I remember feeling like this, I was, you know, about six years old and I was spending the week with my grandparents and they both worked at Walmart corporate. And so there was this store that Walmart employees got to go to called the Associates store. And it's kind of like the original bargain bins or Amazon return place. Uh, it's where employees get to go and go to shop through returned items or damaged packages and stuff like that. And I thought it was super cool. It was like a VIP shopping experience for me. And in this store, they set up the sporting goods and the toys right next to the watch section. And so for me, it was like a dream section to have the toys and sporting goods right next to each other. So I walked with my grandpa and he was looking at some watches in a watch case over here. And I was over here looking at sporting goods stuff and figuring out what I wanted to take home to play with for the week, whether it was a new toy or it was a new basketball, um, a football flag, football set, whatever it might have been. And so we're both looking. And then when I'm done and I got my arms full of the stuff that I wanted them to buy for me, I turn and I walk back to the watches and my grandpa's gone. And in this moment, I remember the fear that began to set in, the concern, the worry, the confusion. I'm sitting there wondering, where did he go? Why am I here by myself? How could he just forget me? And then it gets deeper and I begin to wonder, did he just leave me here? Like, am I now here by myself for the rest of my life? And as I'm trying to figure out where do we go, what do I do, how do, how do I walk through that? And I remember an associate walked up to me that worked there and she said, she said um, are you okay? And I said, no, I've lost my grandpa. And she said, well, what's his name? I said, um, it's William or Will or Willie or Bill Lopez. I don't care what you call him in this moment, but I, I, I'm lost and I'm scared. So she walks over and she picks up the phone, the intercom system for the store. And she says, oh, William Lopez, your grandson is at the watches section and he is looking for you. Now keep in mind that I said that I went with my grandpa and my Nana. So now over the intercom system, you hear, William Lopez, your grandson is looking for you. And now my Nana, why is my grandson looking for his grandfather? Uh, anyway, we reunited and everything was good from there. And I didn't get any trouble because I didn't do anything wrong, you know. But then there was another time a few years later that I was with my dad at Walmart and we're shopping, getting a couple of essential things. And uh, I guess the theme of the story is here that I should have just learned at a young age not to go to Walmart because I'm going to get lost. And uh, anyway, this one was on my own fault. Um, he's getting some cheese and different stuff. And I decided I wanted to get something else. So I walked to a different section, um, whether it's chocolate milk or candy. I don't remember what it was in that moment, but I went and got it and I turned around and my dad is gone. And so I begin to search for him and I can't find him. I begin to get worried again. I begin to wonder, did he leave me? Am I stuck in Walmart for the rest of my life? At least I'll be able to survive for a little bit, but this is about to be a really cool movie, I guess, because now I have to live here. And so I go to the front of the store though, as we're looking and I walk up to the front counter um, at the customer service desk and I told him I can't find my dad. And so they get on the intercom system and they said, Dale Dickinson, your son is at the front desk and he's trying to find you. Uh, and he comes walking up and finds me. That one I got in trouble for because again, I was the one that wasn't where I was supposed to be. But in both of these moments, I begin to wonder where the person that was watching over me was. And I got scared. I began to doubt and I got concerned and I was worried. And so when we ask this question, where is God? I think everybody across the board asks a question of sorts of, God, where are you? And, and they, they ask the question of God, where are you? Because scripture says that deep within us, that eternity is etched on our hearts. 
There's something within us that longs for something more than what we are facing in the moment. People ask the question of why does life matter? Why do we exist? Why am I here? It's because God created us and he created us to have a relationship with him. And so deep within us, there's an eternal longing for something more than what we are experiencing in this moment. So we ask the question of God, where are you? But then we also have to recognize that if you listen closely to the stories that I told, that in both of those moments that a store associate assisted me and pointed me back in the direction and helped me find the person that was watching over me, that was uh, responsible for me. So I think there are so many people that are asking the question of God, where are you? But in return, then God's looking around and saying, where are my associates? Where are my people? I've placed you in, on this earth. I've given you these tools, these resources, these gifts. I, I've transformed your life. I've brought you out of situations. So that now when other people ask the question of God, where are you? That you are alongside them and you're walking through life with them, encouraging them, investing in them, uh, uh, celebrating them. It's steering them in a direction that points towards me. But yet so many times this question of God, where are you? Becomes so much deeper. It's when these things like doubt begin to creep in and we begin to wonder if God even exists and if he's even there. We're not sure where to go. We're not sure where to turn because we don't have anybody in our corner. You see where God created relationship, the devil has perfected isolation. Anything that God uses and creates, the devil is going to try and pervert. So where he created relationship with us, with him and with others, the devil is going to try and isolate us. So in an isolation where we, get to, we begin to ask the questions of God, where are you? Because we don't have people around us to encourage us because the church hasn't stepped up in a way to pour into those around them. And, and we begin to have these moments where we doubt. But if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you profess with your mouth and believe within your heart that he died for your sins and you rose again three days later, giving you ultimate power and authority and victory in whatever you face. Scripture says that in the moment there is salvation, you are made new, you are made whole, you're cleansed, you're forgiven, you are redeemed. You are a new creation in Jesus. But then there becomes a process of sanctification. It's walking with Jesus and becoming holy. It's being different than you were the day before. And there's a scripture that says, being transformed in the renewing of your mind. So what if we looked at doubt from a different perspective? We transformed the way that we thought about doubt. So rather than doubt being something that isolates us and we ask this question of God, where are you? And it pushes us away from God. What if we use doubt as like a smoke alarm or as a signal that says, hey, this isn't a question you should be asking. So when we say, God, where are you? Rather than it pushing us away from God, it's actually something that pulls us closer to him. We begin to notice things that aren't what they should be. Or we have people around us that are walking alongside us and saying, hey, I know you're asking these questions, but let those things pull you closer to God and what he has for you. The places he wants to take you, the things he wants to do in you. You begin to wrestle with God in these, in these moments as you ask him these questions. Because when you begin to ask God questions, at least that shows that there's a relationship there and it's not just a religion thing. He wants you to ask him questions. And so you begin to ask, God, where are you? God, where are you? Where is God in this moment? We begin to wrestle. And there's a difference in wrestle and fight. When you're going to fight, you're trying to win. You're trying to remove someone. You're trying to kill something off. You're trying to achieve something and, and dismiss something. You're trying to remove it from your life. You're trying to remove the obstacle. You're fighting to get past it. But wrestling, you're going back and forth, trying to find a, 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 a upper ground. You're trying to find leverage. You're trying to find a solution. If you were to watch a wrestling match, most wrestling matches are going to consist most of the time of an embrace. 
So when you're wrestling, it's okay to, to embrace those things that you're, you're chasing. There's scripture, there's stories about wrestling with the angel of God, fighting for a blessing. And when it comes to God, God is not going to fight you, but he will fight for you. So when you begin to wrestle, you can embrace God and hold on to him and say, I don't know about these things that I'm going through. And I'm really wondering if you're there, but at least you're close enough for me to embrace you. And I can ask these questions because I have a relationship with God, a gnosko, to intimately know is what the Greek says. So where I know Jesus and he knows me. This, this idea of God, where are you? And the response of, well, where are my people? Where are you to come alongside those? Where are the people around you, the circle you placed yourself in to encourage you? Where is God in all this mess that we call life? It says this in Psalms 34, 18. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. So my question is, if the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, then those who are close to the Lord, where should they be? Let me ask you about the time where your spirit was crushed. Where were you when he rescued you? And so if God is saying that he is close to the brokenhearted, then it is the responsibility for Christians, for the church to be close to the brokenhearted to know what they're going through, to be a resource, to be a place of of hope and of healing in these moments. You see, the, the local church has done a great job, a great job of going to church and doing church, but has done a terrible job in recent years of being the church. You see, we've got beautiful buildings and great locations and stuff that we become a trophy and a monument on a hilltop saying, hey, come see us. Come put, look at this great service we put on. Look at this cool event that we're gonna do. But rather than being a place for the broken and the hurting that need to recognize that they can be made whole and be healed and be loved because of who God created them to be, because he is close to the broken hearted. He's close to the broken hearted. So in this, uh, God, where are you? I think we have to also recognize that we are held responsible for the decisions that we make. See, you can have the right destination or a desired destination in mind, but it is impossible to get there if you're going the wrong direction. If you were going to say, hey, I want to go to Disney World, but you started going north to go to Canada, then it's going to be impossible for you to get to Disney and you're gonna miss the destination because you went the wrong direction. How many times in life have you tried to take a shortcut? How many times has that backfired? I'm an avid shortcut driver. I wanna find a new way, I wanna find a new route, and it doesn't always work out the best. So we have to remember that our destination may be Jesus, but where along the line did maybe we go the wrong direction. And now it feels like that he's not there anymore because we've gone the wrong direction and the destination is further off. And we begin to ask the question of God, where are you? But yet the responsibility is on us because we haven't done our due diligence in following the path that he set for us. The next question I wanna ask is, does God know? God, do do you even know what it feels like to face hurt? Do you even know what it feels like to lose your job? Do you even know what it feels like to go through a divorce? Do you even know what heartbreak feels like? Do you wanna know what it feels like in eighth grade when the love of my life is ripped away from me and we won't see each other for the rest of summer break? Do you know what that feels like? Some of you are like, my eighth grade breakup was the worst breakup I ever experienced. I'm not trying to poke fun at you, but we ask this question of God, do you even know what I'm feeling or what I'm facing? And I think we forget that in the beginning of creation, in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, he breathed it into existence. And when he breathed it into existence, there was land, there was water, there was animals. And then out of his own substance, Imago Dei, out of his own image, he created man to reign and rule over the earth, to have a, a perfect relationship with God. And then there was a decision made that changed the direction of his creation. 
So in this moment where a decision was made that changed the direction, the God experiences loss because the relationship that he created that was perfect is now broken. And we are separated from God. And there's thousands of years that begin to take place and you have to do all these crazy things and rituals and to bring a sacrifice to right your relationship with God. One of the examples in the Old Testament is a, is a man named Abraham. And Abraham was told by God to bring a sacrifice laid upon the altar on top of a mountain. And he says, your sacrifice is going to be your firstborn son. And so Abraham goes and tells his son and he says, hey, we need to go and prepare a sacrifice on the top of the mountain. And he said, okay, well, what's the sacrifice going to be? And I'll go get the animal. And he says, no, don't get an animal right now. And he says, well, what's the sacrifice going to be? He says, well, God will provide. So they gather the wood and they gather the rope and the things that they need to go up the mountaintop. And they begin the journey and they begin to climb the mountain and ascend up the mountain. And the son begins to ask, hey, dad, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. They go a little bit further. Hey, dad, where's the sacrifice? God will provide. You know, it's like that are we there yet moment that when you're in the car with your kids, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? You know, the anxiety is building up within them. And they get to the mountain and they prepare the altar and they lay the, the wood on the altar. And he begins to tie his son up. And he ties his son up and he sits them on the altar. So you got to be thinking in this moment, which one of them feels like they're crazier? Is it the son who's saying, oh my goodness, he's tied me up. I'm the sacrifice and I'm letting this happen. Or is it the dad who's saying, oh man, I actually tied my son up and I placed him on the altar and he's about to actually cut him and kill him so he can offer a sacrifice to God. So the blood would then pour out and they look over and there's a ram in the thicket. God provides. But then there was another sacrifice that took place in scripture where another son was offered. And so in this process of, of what sacrifice looked like, God saw these things happening and said, this is not how I wanted the relationship to be. And so he sent his own son to walk the same earth that we walk today and face trials and tribulations and was tested and tried. And he was murdered, crucified, a criminal's death upon a cross, totally innocent, beaten, mock, scorned, unrecognizable as a human being with a crown of thorns placed upon his head. And he died a criminal's death with his blood being shed to be the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me to write a relationship that now was going the wrong direction. So in this moment, God loses his own son and experiences loss to write a relationship that was broken. So in both of these moments, God experiences loss and yet we have the audacity to cry out and say, God, do you even know what I'm feeling in these moments that I'm facing? And he says, absolutely, I know what you're feeling because I've experienced the same things. And that is why you spend time with me to know that I can pour my answers out to you through the experiences that I've showed you that other people have had as well, to give you power and authority through my words so you can know what to face and how to face the thing that we call life. But yet we still cry out and we have these questions of God, where are you? Of God, do you even know? God, are you going to show up? God, where am I going to go? God, what am I going to do? God, where are your people? How does this work? How am I going to ever get past this struggle? How am I ever going to have another relationship? How am I going to have a real marriage when these three have failed? How am I ever going to be made whole when all I do is turn to an addiction? How am I ever going to be able to provide when I keep losing my job because I can't get things in line? So people have to come alongside to encourage and to invest. I want to look at God's response to Habakkuk in verse five here. It says, look among the nations. Remember, he's crying out and he's saying, I cry violence and you turn and you look idly at what takes place. I have these, the injustice happens and the law goes perverted. Those who are wicked consume the righteous is what Habakkuk says. But God says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. 
Think about the process of walking through life, of chasing the destination of Jesus. If you know the destination is Jesus, but he put the path in front of you and showed you all the things that were gonna be the trials that you were going to have to overcome to be strong enough to face the next thing, to make it worth the destination of Jesus because of the sacrifice that he made, the victory that he provides in everything you face though. But would you actually take the step when you saw the things that you were gonna face or would you try and take a shortcut and go a different direction and try and do it your own way or maybe not even take the step at all? And in this moment, God's saying, I have a plan so great that you wouldn't even believe it if I told you. I wouldn't even, you wouldn't even believe it if I told you. Now think about the people outside of church who are longing for purpose. They are longing for placement. They are longing for someone to, for, to show the compassion. They are longing for a resource. They are longing, they want to right the ship. They just don't know what direction to go. So why the reach center and not the real life church, operational outreach, fun, entertainment, compassion center or some other ridiculous name that churches come up with? Because have you ever heard anybody say, if I walked into a church, the whole thing would burn to the ground? Maybe you have a story that your life wasn't changed in a church. Maybe it took place somewhere else. And so we want to provide an avenue in a way where people are confident and comfortable to walk into and equip them to go and be different and be better than when they walked in. And there's going to be some people that come from other churches that need a resource that we can offer. We want to partner with other organizations to point them in the direction that's going to be best for them so that we can offer them a hand up and not just a hand out. So they can, they can break the pattern. They can break the system that they're stuck in so that they can be a better parent than what their parent was. So that they can keep their kids. So that they can land a job to provide for their family. So that they know how to provide in a way that when they have a budget, they can stretch their grocery bill and continue to have food on the table so that they can build a resume, so that they have a warm place to sleep, so that the process can begin. We have a couple of gentlemen that now have a stable income because they have never had a phone and they never had access to internet. So they weren't able to ever do their social security um, paperwork. But a gentleman in our, in our church that said, hey, this is where I work and this is what I do. Let me sit with them at the REACH Center one day during the warming shelter and get the process going. So now that they have a stable income and they can make a different decision than what it was. It says this in Micah 6, 8. The Lord God has told us what is right and what he demands. See that justice is done. Mercy be your first response, your first concern, and humbly obey your God. It says this in, in Romans twelve fifteen: Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is why we do what we do. To show mercy just as Christ has showed mercy to us. To show love just as Christ has showed love to us. To be a a visible representation of an invisible God. When people ask the questions of God, where are you? God, you even know that we can come alongside them and say, hey, I am going to rejoice with you when everything, we feel like we're on the mountaintop and we have a victory. But when things are hurting in their heart, then I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to listen and we're both going to weep because you're hurting and you're broken. And I see that you're hurting and then you're broken because God, I pray that we do that. We see people where they're broken and where they're hurting, but in that hurt and in that brokenness, we can see that God has something greater for them. And then we can see the wholeness and the completeness of what he intended when he created them. And so it is our responsibility as Christians, as the church, to get down in the trenches and to go and reach people, to quit being a monument and a trophy on a hill and saying, hey, come see us. We have a great service on Sunday morning that we're going to get to you, but let's get in the dirt and walk alongside people in life. Let's quit telling the same stories that we've been telling year after year after year and so that we know that new life change is taking place because it's being lived out in the people that are involved in the church because they are active and growing and going forth. 
So the question is, where is my help? Where is my help? It says this in Psalms 121, that my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So when people are asking the question of where do I go? Where is my help? How do they know where help actually comes from if help comes from the maker of heaven and earth? It's because they see it in you and they see it in me. It is poured out of us from the encounter that we have with Jesus in our daily life and it's poured out to them. We are a beacon of hope because it just radiates from us every single day as Christ's love and his mercy and his grace and his humility and the servanthood that he is in our lives is shown to others. Because someone may not walk into a church building, they may not come into the church, but we are the hands and feet of Jesus, meaning we go out and we be the change. We're not just a church in the community, but we are a church that changes the community. Because we got plenty of churches But look at my final verse here. What the church has become so good at is the opposite of this verse. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And the church should be walking in the power and the authority and victory in who Jesus is. Because if he transformed your life, then he is ready to transform another life. Church, we are never finished. Until Jesus returns, there is another soul There is another family. There is another community for us to go and reach and bring the gospel to so that they have new life and know that where they are stuck at is not what God intended. Because when they ask God, where are you? His people are there walking with them. When they say, God, where are you? Let's help get them going in the right direction towards the destination. When they say, God, do you even know? We say, yes, he does. Because he gave his son up and reason for a relationship with you so that we can be a place that works out of power and not just of talk go 90s on it and walk the walk not just talk the talk so that life change takes place so my challenge and my encouragement to you is this get involved whether it's when something takes place at the reach center it's when we go into our community and we have a serve day when we go to the park and we have an outreach, when we open our doors for a blood drive, when we show up on a Sunday morning and we we show someone that they matter because we give them a hot cup of coffee, when we smile at a family walking through the doors that had a hard time getting here, when we lead someone in worship because they feel broken or because they're excited, when we bring them a message to encourage them and to challenge them and show them who Jesus is, maybe it's sitting behind a camera so someone has this experience that you're having right now but get involved to further the gospel. So when people say, God, where are you? We're right there saying, he's still there, but let's get you going in the right direction. When they say, God, do you even know? We say, yes, he does. And he wants to show you what he feels because his heart breaks for you, but he wants to restore those whose hearts are broken because he's close to them. There's a great story of a young man named Trevor that spent time at our warming station this year. And I'm gonna let you watch that video here in a moment, but I want us to be able to walk through life together. Maybe you have questions or you need someone to pray with you and you need to say yes to Jesus or, or whatever that might be in this moment. Maybe you need to get involved, shoot us a message. Go to our Facebook page or give us an email or call the church office. And we would love to be able to get you going in the right direction towards the destination of Jesus. So when you ask the question of God, where are you? Or someone else asks the question of God, where are you? It doesn't push you away from God, but it pulls you closer to him. And you have a real relationship with him. And so the people quit asking God, where are your people? because I don't know where you are because I'm not experiencing that around me. So isolation would be dismissed and community would take place so that we can see our communities changed and not just be a church that's in them, but a church that changes them. 
So we don't just say, go be the hands and feet of Jesus, but we be the hands and feet of Jesus. We go out and we be the change that we wanna see take place because the change that takes place in us through the power of Jesus is the change that he wants to say take place in others. And it took place in Trevor. Real Life Church, I love you. I hope this means something to you. I hope it challenges you. I hope it encourages you to take a step in the right direction, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be around people whose hearts are broken because that is where God is. Look forward to hanging out with you. I hope you are back uh, in the house and we go into week two of Hand Up. But for now, I'm gonna sign off. If you have anything you want us to pray with, uh, pray with you about, then please send us a message and we can walk through life with you. If you wanna know more info about Real Life Church, then you can do that as well. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off here. I'm gonna let you hear the story of Trevor and what the Reach Center meant to him. Love you guys. Can't wait to hang out with you again. And we will see you later. Uh, my name is Trevor Stanley. I'm 33 years old. I'm from Santa Rosa, California. A um, couple things about me. I'm an avid pet enthusiast. Um, uh, semi-pro skateboarder from California for 16 years. Um, I've been a, in the restaurant and hospitality injury, industry for about 10, 10 years or so. One of my favorite passions is cooking outside of, uh, outside of work. Um, I came here from California uh, three years ago. Uh, I moved out here with the intentions of getting clean and sober, and I've had a little bit of a battle from that. Um, some things, uh, trials and tribulations, led me to a bit of homelessness, and I was uh, I was looking for uh, any kind of uh, services that I could use out here to help me get on my feet. And uh, as I was calling around, uh, somebody told me about uh, the Reach Center, and I had no idea what that was. And so I Googled Real Life Church and I spoke to them and they said they had a warming center available um, during the cold uh, winter temperatures. And uh, so I came to the Reach Center and they put me up inside underneath the roof. That was very warm and very pleasant staff. Um, something to eat and a shower free of, free of use. And uh, it was very uh, comfortable and, and uh, warming and homing. And then uh, from there, uh, the pastor at the church, he. Uh, mentioned something about care center and i had actually said you know i was thinking about care center going to care center uh and um that's actually what sparked um a conversation in my head that uh, led me to end up uh to going to care center with full intentions of completing the program and also building a relationship with god since i've been at care center and since i left the reach center into care center i have seen uh, and I've noticed that God has been building a pathway for me uh, and just making small stepping stones that, you know, I've realized that he's put down for me and uh, wants me to realize that there is a path for me in life and I just need to be able to come out of my shell and take those necessary steps to be able to move forward in my life. Uh, I believe that I was brought to real life uh, with the good intentions of moving on somewhere better and that being Care Center. And now that I've been in Care Center, I've had a relationship with God and I've, I've felt 100% um, better as far as me and my personality. Um, I don't worry and I don't stress anymore. I don't have the simple complications of life and I'm able to just be a happier, and better person around. And I know that somewhere in the future, um, I'm not leaning on my own understanding. I'm leaving that up to God because I know He has a plan for me and uh, I'm willing to uh, you know, just keep a relationship open with Him to find out where that leads.